Okay, so let's just start with a quick review of uh, the previous lecture as usual. So last time we finished the discussion about uh, inertial uh, navigation, uh, uh, or specifically dead reckoning technique. Uh, basically, the problem set up is uh, there is a, always a global reference frame, or a, uh, also called a world frame sometimes, uh, which is a fixed coordinate system in which you want to localize yourself, okay? Um, and then uh, the, the problem to solve here is that uh, the, the types of inertial sensors that we typically use in robotics, uh, they have their own body reference frame, we call us a B, and they report the measurements in that reference frame, okay? Uh, and that reference frame is uh, usually strapped down to the, the robot platform uh, that the sensor is mounted on, and uh, it just rotates with the robot. That does, as the robot moves around and, and uh, 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 turns and rotates, your SOB is going to rotate relative to the fixed global reference frame. So we need to find basically a, tra a, a transformation, a geometric transformation that can take the measurements or readouts from the sensor from its body reference frame to the global frame, and then we can integrate those and do that reckoning, right? Um, we also said that there's fancier types of uh, IMUs called stable platform, which have these, you know, motorized gimbals that stabilize and always align the, uh, uh, basically the body frame with the global frame, so they basically uh, uh, mechanically solve this, this transform for you. Um, but those are, you know, very uh, bulky and expensive and typically only used in uh, big, you know, uh, military vehicles and, 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 and airplanes and things like that. For, you know, everyday robotics, uh, almost always you're, you're uh, working with strap-down type uh, IMUs. So the first step is orientation tracking, which is basically we need to find a rotation matrix. We call it C sub G of T. So it's a time-varying 3D rotation matrix that essentially maps your body reference frame or derotates your body reference frame to the global frame. Uh, so any measurement then you have, say a, a uh, acceleration measurement from your IMU that's coming from uh, coming in the body reference frame, you just multiply that by uh, the uh, your rotation matrix C sub G, and then it takes it to the global frame. Right. Uh, so the first step is to find this, and uh, we did the, the 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 math. We showed like how from your uh, gyroscope measurements uh, you can find and track this uh, C sub G matrix. So typically you start from a known initial condition. It can um, be assumed or uh, given from other sensors, and then once you have that over time, at each time step when um, a, a new uh, gyroscope measurement becomes available, you multiply your previous rotation matrix C sub G by this uh, mini rotation matrix, uh, which is given by this matrix exponential e to the uh, delta psi t. So delta psi is a three by three matrix, uh, which basically has your gyroscope readouts in it, right? So it has the omega x, omega uh, y, and omega z arranged in, in, in this format inside it. And again, remember that these omegas are coming in in the body frame, uh, right? So, so, so uh, that's why there's, there's the subscript B uh, for, for all of them. Uh, so it's very simple, right? Uh, I mean, the math was a, 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 a little uh, uh, involved to get here, but once we actually solved everything, uh, it's, it's very clean, right? So you get at every time step uh, all your gyroscope readouts. You populate this delta psi matrix at time t. You take the matrix exponential off it. And if you are implementing your algorithms in um, a compute platform that doesn't support matrix exponentials, we also derive this more computationally efficient, uh, basically, formula uh, for delta psi that I'm not going to rewrite here, but, but, but you know what I'm talking about. So that matrix exponential at each time step, you just evaluate that, uh, multiply it by your previous uh, 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 body orientation matrix, and that gives you, uh, basically that updates your C uh, to the latest. Uh, and then that, that is your orientation tracking step. And then you can go to position tracking. And position tracking is also uh, very simple. So you start with your accelerometer readout. So it's a, 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 a vector in R3, A sub B. So it has the X, Y, and Z component of the acceleration in the body reference frame. Multiply by C sub G, take that to the global frame. 
right? So now we have accelerations in the global fixed frame, and then we just need to integrate them. Uh, so your first integration goes from acceleration to velocity, right? Uh, we should remember to subtract the gravity component, of course. Uh, that's, that's important uh, in, in, in 3D. If you're just doing 2D stuff and everything is planar, uh, you can ignore that if there's no basically Z component to the acceleration measured. But in 3D, like if you're working with a drone or you know, uh, a, a, a vehicle that can go up or downhill, it's very important to uh, uh, subtract your gravity component. It's a fixed vector always, uh, but you just need to basically have it uh, in, the, in the right direction. Um, and uh, so you subtract that from your uh, measured acceleration in the global frame, um, and then multiply by delta t, that's your delta velocity basically. Add that to your previous velocity, that's your updated velocity at time t plus delta t. And same for position. So your position at time t plus delta t is the uh, previous position times velocity plus velocity times delta t, right? So these are just basically discrete, discretized uh, integrals that, 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 that we've written here because always your, your measurements are uh, coming uh, over discretized time at, at, at some update rate. Okay, any questions about this? Okay, uh, very good. And then uh, we also pointed out basically, I mean, this, this technique works really well and it's almost always used, but also uh, it's, it has limitations. Basically, uh, the, the big problem with pure inertial uh, uh, localization is the drift problem, right? Because these sensor updates all have uh, uh, offsets in them and noise, but mainly the offset as you integrate it causes basically a, a drift that, that, that grows unboundedly over time. Um, so I think, uh, um, we are all, in a way, kind of familiar with this effect. Like uh, um, us humans, as we walk around, we are also localizing ourselves. And, and we have sensors in our body. We have inertial sensors, like gyroscopes in our ears. We have visual sensors, like our eyes. And uh, if you ever have tried to walk with your eyes closed, you see you can go a few steps, few tens of steps on a straight line. But sooner or later, you're going to start drifting to one way or the other, and that's the exact same problem. Part of it is the same problem. There's other uh, reasons for us not, not being to you know, walk perfectly straight uh, with our eyes closed, but part of it is because when we are purely uh, doing uh, inertial navigation with our eyes closed, we drift. Uh, and then as soon as we, we open our eyes, now our brain is, is, is doing basically a fusion between uh, the, the visual localization and the inertial. So it's, it's doing what we call visual inertial odometry, VIO. And that's much, much, much more stable and accurate, right? And that's effectively what is done in robotics also. So uh, you always have uh, some contribution from your inertial sensors, but you don't want to purely rely on them. You always mix in either visual sensors or GPS or some other sensor that doesn't drift and do some type of uh, sensor fusion, and then you can uh, localize yourself without, without drift or with very, very little drift. Um, OK, any questions? All right, so uh, then we started talking about uh, Basically, uh, the, the, the new chapter, which we are now starting to um, study sensors that are used for, for mapping, right? And we just, uh, we talked about like uh, different types of maps. There's offline maps and there's live or online maps and uh, uh, they can be um, high definition or high resolution or, or, or low resolution and you know, all the, all the differences. But now we are at this point where we want to start uh, looking at sensors that, that enable mapping for us. And uh, specifically, there's, uh, there's four types of sensors. Uh, so there's, there's sonar, uh, stands for sound navigation and ranging. And uh, this is a, an active sensor that sends uh, out basically uh, uh, acoustic, uh, ultrasonic acoustic waves to the environment and collects back the, the echoes and uses those echoes to uh, basically uh, generate a map of the environment. It's also called ultrasonic sensor. Uh, then there's radar stands for radio navigation and ranging. And it's the same principle of operation, except you send uh, radio frequency electromagnetic waves to the environment. You collect back the, the, the echoes, and then you process those echoes to generate a map. Uh, then there's LIDAR, uh, stands for light uh, detection and ranging. Also, sometimes uh, it's, it's uh, 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 said that it stands for light imaging detection and ranging. Um, so. Uh, 
I, I don't think there's a consensus on the, on the appropriation yet. Uh, but basically, again, it's the same principle of operation, but you're now sending uh, 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 optical wavelengths, uh, electromagnetic waves to the environment, collect back the echoes, and then uh, you uh, build a map based on that. And finally, we have cameras, which is uh, 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 based, it, it, like its principle of operation is very different from the other three. It's not an active sensor in the sense that it, it sends an active signal to the environment and collects back echoes. It just uh, collects uh, light from the environment. And it could be visible light, and that's where uh, you get, for instance, the most common type of camera, which we call RGB camera. But there are other types of camera. There could be IR camera, which collects uh, infrared, uh, sometimes also called thermal cameras. Um, you can have more modern types of camera, like uh, there's now this class of cameras called DVSs or uh, dynamic vision sensors, also called event-based cameras. Uh, so, so they uh, operate slightly differently. Uh, they, they, they are still based on visible light, but the, the type of signal they give you is a little different. So there's different types of cameras, uh, but they all basically uh, uh, collect some, some type of you know, optical signals from the environment, and then they process them. And uh, they give you images, right? So we'll talk a little more about this uh, in a minute. But uh, fundamentally, uh, unlike the, the top three active sensors, cameras don't natively generate maps for you. They generate these projections or images from the environment. But with some signal processing and, and computer vision techniques, you can generate maps from camera signals. Um, OK, so again, the principle of operation of the active sensors uh, uh, is, is, is all the same. So an active, again, is, is sonar, radar, and LIDAR. So sensor transmits a signal to the environment. The environment reflects back parts of that signal as echoes towards the sensor, and the sensor collects the echoes and does some signal processing on the collected echoes. And then from that, to build a map, you need to, or the sensor needs to determine uh, or estimate two things. One is the range to the targets in the scene that reflected back echoes. OK, so you need to do some, some, some range estimation. And you also need to estimate the direction of the targets in the scene, right? Because if it's just range, you can't build a map. The map needs range and, and some uh, angle information. The angle is uh, it's called bearing. Uh, also, in some contexts, it's, it's, it's called direction of arrival, or DOA, or angle of arrival, AOA. These all, for us, they mean the exact same thing. Uh, it's just in different literatures, people use different terminologies. For instance, if you, if you read uh, sonar uh, or ultrasonic literature, bearing is usually the, the term used for, for uh, angle of arrival. In radar uh, uh, literature, it's, it's mostly called DOA, or d uh, direction of arrival. Same thing, right? It's just basically the, the direction of uh, corresponding to different targets that are generating echoes uh, back to the, to the receiver. OK, uh, and then you repeat the process. Basically, the, the, the sensor keeps you know, uh, sending out uh, uh, some, some type of a signal to the environment, collect the echoes, process the echoes to find range and direction of arrival. right? And then from range and direction of arrival, basically, you can make a map or a point cloud of, of the scene, as we'll see uh, in a second. Um, and, and this can be 2D or 3D. In the 2D case, uh, uh, basically, your direction of arrival is typically just the azimuth angle, right? Uh, so you have no sensitivity in elevation. So it's kind of like a flattened out map of the world. And then in the 3D case, your direction of arrival, you get both azimuth and elevation, right? And then you can make a uh, 3D point cloud out of it. Um, so, so this, basically, we talked about range and bearing or direction of arrival. So these are basically the minimum requirements that a sensor needs to, like the minimum um, things that the, the sensor needs to measure or estimate such that it can generate a, a map. Um, some sensors do more than that, as we'll see. So for instance, some sensors also give you the velocity of the targets uh, based on some, some physics of the signals or some other attributes of the target. And those are more advanced uh, sensors. But range and bearing angle is the minimum that a sensor that is useful for robotic mapping needs to, needs to do, as we'll see. Any questions about this? OK. So uh, here's like a picture of how the process of, of, of mapping the environment works. Here we are looking at a 
uh, point cloud from a LiDAR, but the, the general concept, again, is the same for all these uh, different types of active sensors. So basically, the point cloud we're looking at here, it's, it's, it's a collection of a bunch of points, right? Um, they're closely packed, so they look like kind of like uh, straight uh, or, or curved lines, but it's a collection of points. And if you look at every point, basically, the, the back-end process that has happened is that the receiver has uh, transmitted a signal towards that, uh, received back the echo, and from the echo it has estimated the range to that point, we call that rho sub k for the case point, so there's a, there's a range, and a direction of arrival, which in this case it's a 3D uh, basically point cloud, so the direction of arrival consists of two angles. There is an azimuth angle theta and an elevation angle phi, right? So for every point basically there is three parameters um, that the, the receiver has estimated. And then from those, you basically, or the receiver, can uh, put all those points uh, in a common reference frame and generate a 3D point cloud, right? And you see, like, to get a dense map like this, this process needs to happen possibly millions of times, right? We are looking at millions of points probably in this one picture. Um, and, and that's how these sensors operate. Like the modern ones can, can process uh, millions of points per second very fast and, and, and basically detect the range and the direction of arrival to all of those and then visualize all of them in a, in a common uh, coordinate system and give us this very detailed basically point clouds. And then the process can happen tens of times per second and you get these high frame rate basically live maps that are, that are generated. Uh, okay, so the, is this concept of like a map or a point cloud clear, like how, what needs to happen to generate, okay? Now, uh, in terms of the performance of, this, of, of these types of sensors, so again, we said that the uh, principle of operation is almost identical between sonar, radar, and LIDAR, okay? But the performance of the, these sensors is, 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 is vastly different, as, as we'll see. And, and, and when we talk about sensor performance, um, depending on the application, different uh, uh, parameters of the sensor output might be more or less important to you. But typically, uh, the performance, like the key attributes of the sensor that uh, are, are, are important for robotic uh, uh, autonomy applications are uh, these four factors that are listed here. One is uh, basically what is the maximum range that you can map, like how far can you see with this sensor and at what resolution, right? Um, so what is the minimum range difference between two targets that your sensor can discriminate. That is your range resolution, and what is the maximum detectable range? That's one factor that goes into the performance of your system. Then there is the field of view and angular resolution. So field of view, I think it's clear what it means, like how wide uh, you, can, you can map, basically. And it could be in both azimuth and elevation. So you typically give two angles for the field of view. And then the angular resolution is basically what is the minimum angular separation between two targets that your sensor can discriminate. So let's say you have uh, a, a person standing next to a car or a wall or something. How close can they be? for your sensor to still be able to detect there is two different targets in there. Uh, that's, that's another uh, measure of the sensor performance. Then there's measurement rate. So how fast are you getting measurement updates, either in terms of points or frames of a point cloud, like however your sensor is reporting, how fast is that uh, uh, basically update coming? And finally, there is this uh, con concept of dynamic range. Uh, which is basically uh, the, the ratio of the strongest to the weakest target uh, that, that your sensor, in one scene, that your sensor can measure. So dynamic range, perhaps the best way uh, or the most uh, familiar way that, that uh, you have experienced it is with, with cameras. You know, if you, uh, for instance, point your camera to a bright sky, um, you, you either can get you know, the de details in the uh, highlights and shadows of the sky and then things that are uh, on the ground uh, become uh, kind of washed out. Uh, 
Or if you focus it on the ground, you can get you know, the details of highlights and shadows on the, on the ground, and then your, your, your sky basically uh, becomes uh, washed out. So that's because of the limited dynamic range of the camera. Other types of sensors basically have the same limitation. You don't get infinite dynamic range. You always have some, some ratio of you know, the, the brightest to the uh, darkest target. And then this concept of brightness and, and, and darkness is tied to the physics of uh, how you're measuring. So in visible light, it's very clear what we mean by bright and dark. But uh, for instance, when your sensor is measuring acoustic waves, this idea of bright and dark, that is basically how much of the acoustic wave that material reflects back to you. The material that absorbs a lot of the acoustic wave, that is quote unquote dark for a sonar sensor. And the material that reflects back a lot of the acoustic wave, that's a bright material for uh, a, a um, sonar. Uh, and, and that ratio, so what is like the, the, the maximum ratio of the, of the very strong uh, target to the weak target, that is the dynamic range of, of, of your sensor. So of course, we always want the, 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 the best of all of these, right? So we want sensors with very high range, super high resolution, very wide field of view, very high angular resolution, super fast measurement rates, and very high dynamic range. And you're never going to get that. There's always trade-offs between these. Yes? I just, uh, what is the weakest detectable echoes? Because is that like at the sensor level, physics level, or like after signal processing, we can denoise and then we can see some echoes? That that's, a, that's a great question. So I'm just going to repeat it. So the question is, when we say uh, weakest detectable echoes, at what level are we talking about? Is it physics level? Is it at you know the sensing front end? Is it after the DSP? So typically, uh, when we talk about sensor performance, we are talking at system level. Okay, so that's basically at the very output after everything has happened. You know, so after your physics has happened, you've received the echo, you have digitized it, you have done your DSP on it. Uh, denoising, you know, all the algorithms that you can run, and then you get what you get, which is a point cloud. And, and in that point cloud, what is the weakest target that you can, you can distinguish? So, uh, and that's a great question because it's basically a segue into uh, this, this uh, uh, little note here, which is um, all of these performance metrics, these are very complex functions of many things. It's a function of the physics of the sensor, you know, what kind of, for instance, signals it's sending. It's a function of the actual waveforms that you transmit, you know, are we doing, for instance, uh, some fancy digital waveforms or analog waveforms or, or other things. It's a, it's a function of your hardware architecture, you know, how, how low noise your amplifiers are or have you done anything, you know, clever with the hardware architecture. And it's a function of the signal processing algorithms that you're, you're using. So all of these are factored in. And at the end of the day, at the system level, you get a map or a point cloud. And then on that point cloud, you judge basically the, 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 these uh, performance metrics of the, of the sensor. And because it's such a complex function, um, you know, it's, uh, it, that's part of the reason why these different sensors, um, active sensors, although the principle of operation is essentially the same, you get vastly different performance from them because they have different physics, they have different hardware, they have different waveforms, they have different signal processing algorithms uh, associated with them. Also, for the same reason, um, uh, that's why uh, this, you know, um, um, field of sensing for autonomy is still such an active field because there is lots of opportunities to improve the performance on all different fronts from you know the physics to the hardware to the signal processing algorithms as we get better and better and better with uh, with these we get better and better performance out of the out of the sensors um, okay so here is a very very high level and also not super scientific uh, comparison of the sensor performance on, 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 uh, on different metrics. And the reason I say it's not super scientific is because, uh, first of all, each of these basically uh, 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 parameters that we are looking here, for instance, we are looking at range, resolution, speed, cost, and um, the compute required for uh, these different sensors, each of them, there's a huge variance around it uh, because there is no single you know, standard 
way of doing sensing. Each, each sensor, each manufacturer, they have their own hardware, they have their own you know, signal processing algorithms. So the way you should, first of all, I mean, don't read too much into this. This is supposed to just give you a high level you know, sense of what to expect on average today from different sensors. And again, sensors are you know, over time getting better and better. Uh, and if somebody were to you know, redo this table in 10 years, it might look quite different from what I have here. But at a high level, what you get uh, is uh, in terms of range, for instance, sonar uh, has, has uh, typically very short range. And then your LIDAR and ri uh, radar can, can sense long range. And just to give you a sense, by short range in sonar, we mean like less than 10 meters. Long range for LIDAR, radar, we mean hundreds of meters. And then for camera, medium range, it means a few tens of meters probably. Right? And again, that is today. These numbers are going to change and get better for all sensors over time. Resolution, again, sonar is low. Uh, LiDAR can be very high. Radar is medium. It's getting a lot better. I think soon radar is going to be high also. And camera, as we know, can be very high. Uh, and also even camera. Um, I mean, digital cameras have been around for tens of years, but they're still getting better and better um, as, as, as time goes by. Um, so I, I don't want to, again, spend too much time uh, on this, but here you kind of get a sense of why these sensors are complementary. There's none of them where, like, you know, everything is 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 green and 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 great. They all have their own, you know, uh, performance limitations, and that is part of the reason uh, to get a high level of autonomy if you want to, you know, cover a, a, a wide range of use cases in very challenging conditions. You need to use uh, multiple sensors. Also looking at this, it kind of explains you know, why today uh, a lot of commercial autonomy solutions are heavily driven by camera. You know, I mean, camera has a lot of good things, right? You can get very good resolution. You can be very high speed. Cost is low, right? And you get decent range out of it. Um, so, you know, if you were to just pick one today, it, it makes a lot of sense to go for, for camera. Now, you see that the compute requirement for camera is pretty high. And that goes back to my, the point I made earlier, which is cameras don't natively produce maps for you. They give you images, which are projections of uh, the, 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 the world out there. So you need to use computer vision techniques to generate maps from cameras. And um, there's uh, two big classes of uh, you know, how uh, you can do, essentially, mapping with, with cameras. So the big problem to solve is that when you look at an image, frame from a camera, there is no depth information in it, right? Because of that projection operation, depth is entirely lost. So you, don't, you can't get you know, range to different targets. You look at a frame, and you can see oh, there is a tree and a person and a car, but you cannot immediately tell what is the distance to the car or the tree or the person. And that's a big problem that you need to solve to do proper mapping with cameras. Uh, and it's a very complex uh, uh, problem to solve. And that's why it needs a high level of, of, of computation to, to basically do that, to undo the projection operation uh, and, and, and produce a 3D uh, uh, basically map from a camera. And there's two main types of, uh, you know, uh, basically depth estimation uh, techniques for, for cameras. Uh, one big class is called monocular, and as the name suggests, it only uses a single camera. And uh, monocular depth estimation, uh, it, it, used, it, it is used a lot today, but you need to know that uh, monocular depth estimation, or MDE, there is no physics principle behind it. Like, if you only have one camera, there is no way of, you know, no physics that enables you to undo that projection operation. That depth information is completely lost for good, right? But somehow, by the magic of, of neural nets, if you, you know, throw enough data at a big DNN, it eventually learns to uh, estimate depth for you from monocular images, and it does a very well job. But it, it is important to note that any technique that does MDE is pure hallucination, right? And, and, and that means there is, there is a risk factor there because we, we, we don't know, like in some you know, unseen situation, what would that network do? Uh, nevertheless, these are extremely useful. And again, um, us humans, we do that too. If we close one of our eyes, 
with just one eye open, we can still do, you know, pretty decent depth estimation. It's not perfect, but in most situation, it, situations, it, it works fine. Then for stereo vision, that's when you have two cameras with some distance, which is called the baseline. And then uh, by capturing two frames from two cameras of the same scene, which are not co-located, uh, you can estimate depth and do mapping. And in stereo vision, then there is real physics. That's like how our eyes work, because you're looking at um, basically the, the scene from two different points. And then by doing some geometry, uh, like triangulation, you can estimate depth. So stereo vision, uh, that's not hallucination. That's, you know, there's real physics behind it. Uh, and for stereo depth estimation, also there is, you know, very principled uh, um, algorithms based on, you know, um, 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 optics and geometry. And there is some uh, uh, learning-based algorithms, and more modern ones actually do a little bit of both. They do a little bit of learning-based plus a little bit of more uh, principled um, algorithms. But again, the, the high-level point is you can do mapping with cameras, and you can generate you know, 3D uh, point clouds. Uh, it needs a high level of computation. If you do it with a single camera, the, the, the caveat is that at the end of the day, you're hallucinating, and, and there's a risk involved. If you do it with two or more cameras, like stereo vision, uh, then uh, there's, there's real physics behind it, and, and, and typically no, no hallucination involved. Any questions? OK, so we're going to start basically going in depth about sonar. And then we'll talk about uh, radar and LIDAR in a, in a couple of weeks. Uh, but uh, right now, the topic of discussion is, is, is sonar. So as we said, principle of operation is, is pretty simple, right? You have some, some emitter. It emits uh, an ultrasonic acoustic wave. It hits a target. And then the target generates an echo that reflects back towards uh, uh, your uh, sensor. And then uh, a, a receiver receives that, that echo. And uh, based on the time of flight principle that we learned as we were studying uh, GPS, if, the, if you can measure that time of flight, from that you can estimate range, right? Um, so range is, is row here. One thing to note is that uh, the relationship between your, your range and your time of flight um, is you should account for basically the round trip delay, right? So if, if your total time of flight is tau, that is your forward path and the return path time of flight, right? So that's the full round trip time of, time of flight. And because of that, when you want to convert that to range, you want to divide tau by 2 and then multiply it by the velocity of the wave, right? So that's why there is a, there's a factor of uh, uh, one half there compared to the GPS. The GPS was one way, right? Your transmitter was uh, transmitting, the receiver was receiving, it, it was just a one-way travel. For active sensing, your transmitter and receiver are co-located, and then your signal does a full round trip. So that's why there is a factor of, of one half. So that's how ranging works for any active sensor, basically. Um, uh, here, uh, in this picture, we don't see how bearing or direction of arrival estimation works. We'll talk about that in a bit. Um, but for now, we're going to start basically by studying uh, the physics of the acoustic waves, and, and specifically this transmitted wave, how how, is, how does that look? You know, what is the physics of it? How is it related to the geometry of the, of the emitter and, and, and so on? Okay, so let's, let's just start by uh, basically talking about what is an acoustic wave. So acoustic waves are basically pressure waves that travel in different materials. They can travel in solids or liquids or gases. And uh, basically what the wave is, is this uh, periodic patterns of high and low pressure in the, in, in, in the material. So you, you have basically compression points in the material, which uh, is, is, is uh, basically a high pressure point. And then you have uh, uh, basically uh, rarefaction points, which is a low pressure point, And it periodically basically repeats in the material and travels at some uh, uh, speed uh, v. The wavelength 
of the wave is the distance between two peaks uh, or two high pressure points. And uh, you also have the frequency of your acoustic wave, which uh, basically is related to the speed v and the wavelength lambda by this equation. So frequency is uh, velocity over, over lambda, basically. Um, audible sound, for instance, the frequency, as you might know, is between 20 hertz and 20 kilohertz. And ultrasound is anything above 20 kilohertz. Uh, so above audible frequencies, that's uh, what ultrasonic uh, wavelengths are. And that's what is, is, is used for, for sensing, typically. Now, uh, one thing to note is that, and this is a source of big complication when it comes to acoustic sensors, uh, um, sonar uh, sensors, is uh, that the speed of sound uh, depends on material properties. So it depends on, uh, for instance, the density of the material. Uh, even for air, it depends on the temperature uh, of, of air. Also, it depends on the humidity level of air. So it does vary quite a bit. Uh, so uh, for instance, just the temperature dependency uh, can be approximated by this equation here. Um, so your, your T sub C is the temperature in degree C. Uh, so T plus 273, that's your absolute temperature in Kelvins. As, and as you see, there's a square root there. Um, so generally speaking, uh, your uh, sonar sensor uh, does not know the, you know, all the material properties of the medium in which the acoustic wave is, is, is propagating. So it just makes an assumption for what V is for some nominal conditions. And if the actual conditions are much different, like if the temperature is much higher than what was assumed or the humidity level is very different, that V is going to change. And as we know from the time of flight equation, that is going to cause an error in your range estimate, right? Uh, so, so that's just uh, one thing to note. The other thing to note is um, sound velocity compared to, for instance, electromagnetic waves is very, very low, right? Like this number V in nominal conditions, say like, I don't know, like at, 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 at 25 degrees C temperature is around 330 meters per second, I think. 330, 340 meters per second which is a million times slower almost than the speed of light or speed of electromagnetic waves, okay? So this is one of the reasons, if we go back to our comparison table up here, that's for instance why we say sonar speed is very low. I mean, that's just from the physics of it. Sound waves travel very slowly compared to electromagnetic waves. And that is going to be a big limitation for when it comes to, to sensing, as we'll see. Uh, so, so uh, Right off the bat, you know, the physics of, of, of acoustic waves, you know, impose some, some big limitations on, on what your sensor can and cannot do. Okay, um, now the behavior of these acoustic waves is governed by the wave equation, uh, which, is, which is given uh, here. And what the wave equation is, is that uh, we have uh, this parameter P which is a function of position r and time t. And that's the acoustic pressure in the medium. Okay? And what the acoustic pressure is, is the local deviation from the, from the ambient, uh, basically, pressure in the material. Uh, so it can be positive or negative, based on if there's like compression or, or rarefaction in the material. And the wave equation, basically, what it is, it, it's the Laplacian of p. Um, so that's this term, which is basically the sum of the second derivatives with respect to x, y, and z. So if r is our position um, vector at some point in space, we are measuring that pressure. So it's the x, y, z vector, and then the Laplacian is, is given by the sum of the second derivatives. Minus 1 over velocity squared times the second derivative with respect to time is equal to 0. So this is a very famous you know, uh, uh, wave equation in physics. Uh, and it's for any type of wave. I mean, you, you, you look at you know, electromagnetic waves, it's basically the same equation. Instead of acoustic pressure, then it's your uh, electric field amplitude. And then instead of V, you put in the speed of light. And then that's your basically wave equation in, in electromagnetics. So this is basically the equation we need to solve. Uh, to find what the acoustic wave that is traveling in the medium is, what the this, this sensor transmits to the medium uh, is, is, is determined by, by, by this uh, equation. 
Um, the solution um, depends on the uh, shape or the geometry of the aperture that is generating the acoustic wave. So that aperture, for instance, the simplest one is, is an audio speaker, right? The speaker that, you know, cone-shaped thing, typically that's the aperture that's vibrating and generating uh, the, 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 the sound wave. So the shape and geometry of it uh, is, is uh, a big factor that determines the solution and also the boundary conditions and the vibration pattern. Okay, the vibration pattern, we're going to start simple and assume our emitter is just vibrating at a fixed constant frequency. So it's just generating a pure tone, basically, of, of acoustic wave. So in that case, if you have single frequency vibration, your, your, your time dependence of your pressure uh, is, is just, you know, just a harmonic term, which we write as e to the j 2 pi ft, where f is the frequency of the, you know, of the, of the vibration of the emitter, okay? Um, again, we're working with complex exponentials here. Remember that the physical solutions are just a real part of it. Okay, so that time dependency is, is easy. Uh, the position dependency is the, is the more complicated part that uh, we need to figure out. Now it turns out that for very simple uh, aperture uh, geometries for the, for the emitter, uh, we can have very simple solutions for the, uh, for the acoustic wave. The simplest one is if you have like an infinite plane, you know, at, at an infinite plane that is vibrating at some uh, frequency f, it will generate what we call uh, plane waves, okay? And the plane wave solution is given by this expression here. As you see, your p of um, r and t, uh, there's some a, that's the amplitude, uh, times e to the j minus k dot r, we'll talk about this uh, in a second, but that's your time dependency that we talked about, uh, 2 pi ft, that's just, you know, that pure harmonic oscillation. What this k dot r is, k is what we call a wave vector, and uh, what the wave vector is, is a vector with an amplitude that is 2 pi over the wavelength, okay, and a direction that is uh, uh, given by this unit vector k hat. And k hat is, uh, determines the direction of the propagation of these plane waves. And uh, so basically what happens in the case of an uh, emitter that is this infinite planar surface that is vibrating, your waves, uh, acoustic waves are also like the surfaces of constant pressure are also infinite planes, and they all propagate in a direction that is determined by this uh, k hat uh, vector. And that k hat is basically the, the vector that is normal to the aperture that is, that is generating uh, the wave. Uh, I'll show you a picture in a second to, to clarify this. Uh, but the um, big thing to, to note is uh, this term k dot r, that's the inner product of your wave vector with the position at which you're looking at the, the, the pressure. And um, from, from linear algebra, we know that uh, when you have a fixed vector k, k dot r, the, the points on which k dot r is, is constant, they determine a, they, they define a plane, right? That's the definition of a plane in, in, in linear algebra. So it should make sense that this, this equation basically gives you this planar geometry for the waves. Another very simple emitter uh, geometry that uh, we can solve the wave equation for analytically is a point source. So if you have this infinitesimal small point that is just like vibrating in place at some frequency f, it generates what we call spherical waves. And spherical waves, the equation for uh, the acoustic pressure is, 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 is given here. Uh, here, as you see, the amplitude is not constant. It's A over R, and that's kind of like because of the conservation of energy as the spherical wave, spherical wave propagates in every direction, right? So the energy gets, you know, spread out. Uh, as, as it uh, propagates, and that's why you have like a 1 over R uh, here. Uh, e to the J 2 pi ft is there, that's just our, you know, time uh, dependency that is uh, always the same. And then in the exponent you have uh, your, your wave number, norm k, times norm r, right? So note the, the difference between the plane wave. In, in the plane wave case we had k dot r, that was the vector inner product. Here we just have the multiplication of norm k times norm r. Uh, norm k times norm r, norm k is a constant, so, so remember norm of k is always 2 pi over lambda. So this term, if I were to rewrite it, uh, just the, the, the position dependency of it is minus j 2 pi over lambda times norm of r, right? 
For this to be constant, that means norm of R should be constant, right? There's, there's not, not, everything else is constant. So norm of R constant, that's, that's a sphere, right? Uh, so that's why the, the surfaces of constant pressure in this case define spheres, and the, those are spherical waves. Before I show you the pictures to clarify, um, note that both of these types of waves, the plane waves and, and this perfect spherical waves, uh, these are not physically possible to generate in the, like the ideal versions of them. We can get close to them. Why they're not possible? Because those emitter geometries are not physically possible. We can't have you know, an infinitesimal point as an uh, acoustic wave source. We also can't have an infinitely big plane as an acoustic wave source. Nevertheless, these are you know, a good start to understand you know, how waves work and um, kind of making our way towards more realistic geometries. Uh, so here's a picture. So in this case, on the left, you see uh, the, the, the plane wave. So this black line is basically the source. It extends to infinity, right? So it's an infinite plane. And then the waves that are generated, uh, basically that's the K vector that is uh, perpendicular to the, to the source, determines the direction of the travel of the wave. And then as you see, these surfaces of constant pressure are just line, uh, planes. That's why it's called a plane wave. And um, uh, uh, you know, uh, points of the same pressure as, as we know are a wavelength apart. For the spherical case, your source is just a tiny dot uh, oscillating at, at, at uh, and physically oscillating, right? This is sound waves at uh, frequency uh, f, and then it generates these uh, waves with uh, surface constant pressure surfaces that are spherical. I'm not. I'm just showing a cross section here, so these are really, you know, propagating in, in, in three dimensions in every direction and our pressure at a point R is given by, by this uh, expression. One thing that we did not account for in here is the fact that uh, wave propagation, acoustic wave propagation in any, any medium is lossy, right? Um, and by lossy, I mean some of the wave energy uh, gets dissipated as heat. As it, and that's because of the viscosity of the, of the medium as it, as it propagates, right? That is not factored in here. You know, this A, we just take it to be a constant, right? But it turns out that the amplitude itself uh, uh, drops uh, because of the, uh, of the lossiness of the, of the media. And the, the, uh, basically, that, that attenuation uh, factor is uh, modeled by, by what is called the Stokes' law of sound attenuation. So it turns out that in, in, uh, in reality, the A itself, which is the amplitude, um, uh, drops exponentially with range. So our norm of R is you know, how far away you are from your source or your emitter. Um, and then you get this exponential uh, decay, which is e to the minus alpha times R. And alpha is your attenuation factor for the, uh, for the wave. Uh, alpha depends on a number of parameters of the medium, so it's given in the Stokes' law by this uh, expression here. Um, there's a lot in there, but uh, most of these are just material properties. For instance, eta is, is what is called the dynamic viscosity coefficient. Uh, rho is the medium density. Uh, v in the denominator is the, is the uh, wave speed, so speed of sound, basically. Uh, the really important one is, is this f squared factor in the, in the, in the numerator. Uh, so our attenuation factor grows with the square of the wave frequency, right? So the higher the frequency, you get more attenuation uh, as, as, as it propagates. And uh, this is, for instance, the main reason um, sometimes you're you know, walking uh, on the street and there's loud music playing inside a building or in a car that's driving by, and you hear the bass, right? You hear the beat, but you don't hear the high frequency. Uh, content of the music typically, and that's because the high frequency content, according to Stokes' law, will attenuate much, much faster. The low frequency content, which is the bass, that doesn't attenuate as much, and that's usually what we hear when we are far away from, from a source of music, right? So um, here's a plot of basically actual measured attenuation factor for acoustic waves in air. These were measured in uh, uh, 25 degrees C air. And you have many curves in here, and that's because 
the measurement has been done for uh, different, uh, basically, humidity levels, relative humidity levels in, in the air, from 0% all the way to 100% relative humidity. And as you know, humidity affects, um, um, the, the, of course, the viscosity, but also the, 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 the sound travel of, uh, in, in the air. So that's why you get different attenuation curves, basically, for different um, humidity levels. High level, as you see, and th this here, there's a line which is our, our Stokes' law, basically. That's, that's the line, right? And as you see, I mean, yes, at, at super low frequencies, the actual measured values deviate quite a bit from the Stokes' law, but the, at higher frequencies, they get all pretty close to, uh, basically, the Stokes' law. And note that both axes, the frequency and the alpha attenuation, are logarithmic in this plot. Okay, I mean, Stokes' law looks like a line, but that's because we're plotting it in a log-log scale. Now, when it comes to what frequencies we use for uh, sonar in, in, in robotics, uh, as I said, it starts at 20 kilohertz, which is right above the audible frequencies. And normally, we go up to uh, about 150 kilohertz or so. That's the range that is used for sonar in robotics. And in this range, if you look at your attenuation levels you know, from the Stokes' law, you know, it's, it's from 10 to the minus 2 to 10 to the 0. Right? That's, that, that's the range of attenuation that you get in this frequency range. And it is a lot. It is, it is really, really a lot. And th this is, again, why if you refer back to the high level comparison table I showed you a, a few minutes back, we said the, the maximum range for sonar is low. It could typically see up to like 10 or maybe 15 meters. And that's again dictated by the physics of acoustic waves at these frequencies. You get a very, very high attenuation factor so you just don't collect back enough energy from the, the targets that are far away from you because of this attenuation factor. Yes? Uh, what are the percents mean on the plot? Uh, these are humidity levels. So the measurement was, has done um, at different relative humidity levels in air. So 0% is you know, completely dry air, and 100% is the maximum humidity that the air can, can sustain at 27 degrees C. Um, Okay, so again, just we haven't like talked about you know the sensor architecture or you know the DSP or anything like that yet, but just by studying the physics, we kind of know what to expect from a, a sonar sensor. So it's gonna be slow, and that's because the sound travel is a slow, comparatively slow with you know compared to radar and lidar, because uh, electromagnetic waves travel million about a million times faster, and it's also not going to have a ton of range because of a high attenuation factor in the air, okay? Nevertheless, it's an extremely useful sensor. We just need to know its, its limitations when we're studying it. Uh, okay, so uh, when it comes to what acoustic frequency you want to choose for your sensor, there is a big trade-off. Uh, as we just learned, from Stokes' law, lower frequencies uh, attenuate less, right? So that means it helps with the maximum range that you can sense. But uh, on the other hand, higher frequencies increase the angular resolution. And we'll see how. We have, I haven't, I haven't uh, showed you how and why. Uh, but, but that's a big trade off, right? So you want higher frequencies for better resolution. But that means you're going to lose range, and then that's a that's a trade-off. That I mean, it's it's kind of like a design parameter that you know, as somebody designs a sensor, they need they need to study this trade-off and find you know for this application what is the right uh, frequency to choose based on the resolution requirements and the maximum range requirements that they have. So some examples, as I as I said, for robotic sonar in air, right. Because you can also do sonar in, in, in water, as, 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 as you might know. It's actually very common to do sonar in, in, in water. And the numbers change, right? Because water is a very different medium. The sound is different. Your attenuation factors are, are, are different. Velocity is different. So, so here, the numbers are for air. Okay, um, But uh, the frequencies that are used are between 20 and 120 or 150 kilohertz, typically. And with that, you get about a range of 10 meters. Again, these numbers are not set in stone, right? Like you might find somebody who is doing 
sonar and air at, I don't know, two or 300 kilohertz, and that's fine. Or somebody might come up with clever signal processing techniques to see 20 or 30 meters. But these are, you know, ballpark numbers. But for sure, with sonar at these frequencies in air, you cannot see 100 meters or 200 meters. That's for sure. And the angular resolution kind of, you know, that, that, that you can expect is about, you know, less than a degree. Like, I've, I've seen as low as 0.2 or 0.1 degrees, um, not, not much less than that. Now, as you know, uh, sonar imaging is also extremely common in medical applications, right? In medical ultrasound, um, so, so that's uh, basically the images called sonograms, uh, they use very different frequencies. So the frequencies are much, much higher. They're in the megahertz range, so almost like a thousand times higher than what we use in, in robotic applications. And because of that, according to Stokes's law, they're going to get a much, much higher attenuation. But that is fine because in medical applications, you only need to see you know, the uh, inside of a body. So as long as you can penetrate a few inches, you're good. And that's actually the, the maximum range that they get. They only get a few inches, but they get much, much, much higher resolution because they're operating at a higher frequency. And I mean, I, I, I don't know if you have seen the, the latest, you know, latest and greatest in, in, in sonograms. I mean, they're amazing. They can reconstruct the, the, in the organs in the body in 3D with extremely high detail. And, and that's by basically by the physics of, you know, operating at high frequencies and also doing very uh, good signal processing uh, on, the, on the signals that they receive. In robotics, unfortunately, I mean, inches is not useful. We need, you know, at least, you know, a few meters. So that's why we operate at lower frequencies and we pay the price of uh, basically not having uh, the best resolution. Any questions? Yes? Would it be possible to generate a wave, uh, a frequency that's below the audible uh, range for humans so we could get increased range? Uh, you can. Uh, you, you would need to basically be below 20 hertz. So it's, it's going to be, you know, a very, very low frequency. Uh, and, and you can get long range, but you get very poor, very, very poor resolution with that. Um, so it might or might not be useful depending on what the application is. I have not seen that, I should say, like operating at such low frequencies. Some animals do, I think. Um, but uh, for robotics, I have not seen that. Um, also, there are some practical issues. You know, you typically need you know big drivers for such low frequencies and things like that. Um, but yeah, in principle, it should be possible. Okay, so um, we looked at basically uh, two. Um, idealized cases of, of uh, acoustic waves. It was the plane waves and spherical waves. And we said that um, these are mathematically interesting because uh, uh, we, can, we can solve the, the, the wave equation analytically, basically, for those types of emitters. But in reality, the, 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 the emitters that we work with for sensing um, are, are different. Um, um, and, and we need to find the solutions to the wave equations for those types of emitters. Specifically, the most common one for sensing is uh, emitters that are basically just a, just a little circular emitter, it's like a disc, basically, or a piston that vibrates in, in, in place. Uh, and so they have finite size, and they're basically mostly just, just round, you know, circular uh, discs. So we need to, you know, basically solve our uh, wave equation for that type of emitters to, to get a more realistic, uh, um, uh, basically, understanding of, of what type of acoustic waves we're, we're, we're dealing with. Um, and the way we can uh, do that is uh, using, uh, so if you want to find basically the, the, the beam pattern that is generated by a finite size circular disk that is vibrating, we can use a principle in, uh, from optics, which is called the Huygens Fresnel principle. Um, what it says basically, um, I'm going to skip over the words and just show you the picture because I think it's, it's easier to understand. So let's say you have, so this, this blue disc here is your uh, emitter or the aperture that is vibrating to generate an acoustic wave for you. So it's a finite sized round disc. And it's some, in its some plane, x, uh, the coordinates are in x prime, y prime you know, uh, axes. It's uh, in a plane. 
And uh, we have some observation point in the 3D space in which we want to find what is the acoustic pressure that is generated by uh, that emitter. And what the hoyens fresnel principle says, uh, basically, is you can uh, break down this uh, emitter, whatever the shape is, here ours is, is a circular disc, but whatever it is, you can break it down into small points, right? There's going to be an infinite number of them, but you can, you know, decompose it to small points, and each point uh, would then be generating, as we know, a spherical wave for you, right? So if you basically sum or integrate an infinite number of spherical waves that are generated by all the points on your aperture, and sum their contribution all up at your point of observation, that gives you the actual solution to your wave equation or the actual wave that you would measure at that point. Is the concept clear? So it's basically like a superposition uh, type principle, right? Um, you just look at the geometry of your aperture, you integrate over all the points on the aperture surface, and then each point is basically generating a spherical wave here that travels, and we have the exact expression for the spherical waves, and then you just sum them up, all of those, at your point of observation, and that gives you what your acoustic wave is. The principle, again, is from the optics, so if you have like an optical source, you could do the same as we'll see, for instance, when we study uh, LIDARs, but it's for any type of you know, wave, basically the same principle can be applied. Now, it turns out that you can do further simplifications on top of the Hoyens Fresnel principle. Uh, the first simplification that you can do is that if, if the distances that you're interested in are much larger than a wavelength, you can do your first uh, simplification. And that simplification is called the Fresnel Kirchhoff, uh, basically, approximate integral. And for sensing, this is always the case. I mean, lambda for, for ultrasound acoustic waves, I mean, these are, we're, we're talking about like less than, less than an inch or so. Um, so, so we're always, you know, interested in, in things that are, uh, almost always uh, interested in things that are further away. And then uh, we can basically approximate the uh, hoyens fresnel integral by, by this integral. So what this is, let's break it down. This is just a constant, right, one over j lambda. And then the integral is done over the, the source aperture, so basically over our circular disk in our case, or whatever the geometry is, but we're we are looking at circular uh, apertures right now. And what we are integrating is this P of R prime, uh, that's the acoustic wave amplitude on, at the source, right? So R prime is the coordinate of the points on the, on the aperture that is vibrating. So P of R prime is known, right? Because that's where we are generating, basically. That's the source. And then this term here, e to the minus j norm k rho over rho, uh, rho is the distance from, um, if I go one slide back, rho is the distance between a point on the source and our point of observation. That's the distance rho. So that's R prime on the source. R is our point of observation. And they have some distance rho. And there's an angle theta uh, between them, uh, or between the plane of the source and your point of observation. So this term here is that's basically your spherical wave, right? Uh, that, is, that is generated at point R prime and has traveled a distance rho to get to your observation point. And then there's this cosine theta term, which is uh, theta is the, basically the, the angle between the emitter plane and your observation point R, OK? OK, good. I mean, this is OK. You can numerically you know, solve this integral and find your, your uh, uh, acoustic pressure at the point R. But we want, we want something simpler to work with, something that you know, is, is analytical and then helps us you know, to gain some intuition into how, how uh, um, the, the, the acoustic wave propagates in this space. So there's one more level of approximation you can do on, uh, on top of the Fresnel-Kirchhoff. And that's, again, if you're looking at even further distances, so if you're looking at what is called the far field, which is distances rho that are much greater than a squared over lambda, where a is the radius of this circular aperture. So the aperture or the emitter, if it has a radius a, uh, if you're looking at distances which are much greater than a squared over lambda, which again, it's called far field and 
the term might, you know, suggest that, oh, this means, you know, you need to be tens of meters away. No, actually, if you're two inches away, you're already in the far field, or maybe sometimes even one inch away. I mean, if you plug in numbers of, you know, what realistic uh, dimensions and wavelengths are, you would see that it's called far field, but it's physically not that far. So we are almost always in the far field regime when it comes to, to sensing, okay? So then you can further simplify your Fresnel-Kirchhoff integral. So basically what happens is that in the previous slide, we had this, you know, cosine theta term. That becomes almost equal to one because you're so far away. And then you can do some approximation on what rho is at the, at the far field. And after you apply those approximations, your integral reduces to what is called the, the, the Fraunhofer equation. And this is what it is. Uh, so you still have some, some constant, okay, which is, depends on rho, the distance, lambda, and kappa is just some phase factor that comes out of the integral. And then what you have, this P of x prime, y prime is, again, is the acoustic pressure at the source at some point x prime, y prime on, top, on, on your aperture. Okay, so it's known, times this uh, complex exponential, okay, which is e to the minus j uh, norm k, the wave vector, uh, times x prime x plus y prime y over z. Okay? x and y are your coordinates of the, x, y, z is the coordinates of the point of observation, and x prime y prime is the, is the coordinates of your point on the source over which you're integrating. So we're summing up over all x prime y primes, Again, because we need to add the contributions of all the points on the source. And then we're observing what the pressure is at some point with coordinates x, y, and z. So if I just rearrange this plug in 2 pi over lambda for norm k, uh, I get what is at the bottom. So all that changed from the top row to the bottom is, is this complex term here, right? So again, I've plugged in norm k equals 2 pi over lambda. And I've taken lambda into the, the sum and just uh, kept the 2 pi here. If you look at this here a little bit, it should become obvious that what you have in this integral is just a Fourier transform. It's a 2D Fourier transform, but it's a Fourier transform nevertheless. Specifically, if you want it to become more, more obvious, we can rename the variables. So you can call x over lambda z, call that uh, psi and your y over lambda z called that eta, and then it's, it's basically a Fourier transform of your uh, p x prime y prime. I mean, in 1D, if I have some function p of x prime, what is the Fourier transform of it? Fourier transform of x prime is integral p x prime e to the minus j 2 pi f x prime dx prime, right? This is the definition of the force. I mean, there might be a constant here that I've forgotten. I don't know, 2 pi or 1 over 2 pi or something. Uh, but the main thing is that this integral is the, is, is, is the Fourier transform, right? Uh, same thing here. We have the exact same thing, except it's in 2D. So this is a really, really powerful, beautiful result, which tells you your far field, basically, radiation or acoustic wave uh, is, is uh, related to the geometry of your source via a Fourier transform. Uh, and the exact same principle, by the way, applies in optics also. If you have a study, what is called, there is a field called Fourier optics, which is all based on this, basically. It tells you if you're looking at uh, optics at the far field, the relationship to the source is basically just a Fourier transform. Okay. So where we started was a circular disk, right? So to find our uh, uh, basically um, uh, beam pattern or radiation pattern, we need to find the 2D Fourier transform of a circular disk. So specifically what we have, our P of X prime Y prime, which is the wave we are generating at the source, is uh, a constant A0 inside the circle. If the circle has radius A, so when x prime squared plus y prime squared is, is, is less than a, so that's inside the disk. We have at the source, at the emitter, uh, we have some acoustic pressure, a zero, and outside it's zero, okay? That's the definition of a uh, emitter that is a circular disk. And, and then we need to basically find a 2D Fourier transform of this function. Uh, so you plug it into your uh, integral. The a zero, of course, comes out, so you just need to basically evaluate uh, this integral. And it turns out that you can do that 
almost analytically, the result is given here. That's the famous 2D Fourier transform of a circular disk. If you're interested in you know, how exactly this is derived, there's a link in the notes that you can look. But at high level, what you get is an expression where the dependency on, on the distance between your observation point and the source is just one over rho, right? So acoustic wave pressure drops by one over distance. And the um, dependency on the angle bearing or, 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 or DOA is given by this kind of like complicated looking expression which has this mysterious function J1 in it. And J1 is called the Bessel function of the first kind of order one. Uh, it's extremely you know, uh, uh, um, useful function in a lot of, you know, communication theory and, 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 and other fields, but basically J1 is given by this, this integral here. Um, so your angle dependency is determined by a Bessel function, and your range dependency is just one over range for the acoustic wave that uh, you generate at some uh, observation point, rho and, and, and theta, okay? Well, this is just math. I think uh, let's let's look at some uh, you know um, visualizations of what this actually looks like. Here's just a recap of what we talked about. So, at some observation point R, your far field beam pattern is basically given by this expression. Alpha is just a constant. A squared is the square of the the, the radius of your Aperture, so that's a measure of its area, basically. F is the frequency, rho is the distance to your observation point from your emitter, and this thing 2j of you know norm k a sine theta over norm k a sine theta is your angle dependency. This is the important term, actually, that, that we're going to focus on uh, in the next few slides, because we want to know how, as a function of angle, your uh, basically beam pattern uh, changes, OK? Now, um, Let's look at a plot of, uh, of our uh, basically beam pattern, this function that, that we found. Uh, we're, we're plotting it at a fixed distance just as a function of theta, right? So perhaps it's easier to look at the bottom plot first. So if this is your circular disk that is emitting a acoustic wave, and then you're looking at some fixed distance from it, doesn't matter what it is, but the, the distance, we just want to take it out of, out of the picture and just see as a function of angle how the, the acoustic wave uh, pressure changes. You get this interesting, you know, flower looking pattern which has a lot of the energy as you see is concentrated in what we call the main lobe, right? And that's basically how you're directing most of the acoustic wave. You're directing it into the main lobe. And then you have a little bit, you know, kind of in, in the side lobes at, at, at higher angles. So the main lobe, uh, it's, it has, uh, it's between two angles, plus and minus theta zero. And you can actually find what exactly theta zero is. The expression is given in the previous slide. It's arc sine of this, which is some constant times the speed of, of uh, sound divided by A times F, okay? What's really, really insightful here is what do we want? If we want to make a sensor, uh, you want to direct most of your acoustic energy in a tight beam, right? Because then you can basically point it at different parts of the scene, kind of like a laser pointer, except it's acoustic waves. And then the echo that you get, you kind of know it's coming from the direction that your, your uh, acoustic wave was, was pointed at. So you want theta zero to be small, right, for sensing applications. Uh, obviously not for, um, like if you're, if you're making a, a uh, audio speaker, you probably don't want theta zero small, right? You want everybody to hear what the speaker, except that for some specific application, you want your speaker to be directional. Speakers, you want them wide, right? Sensors, you want your emitter to be nice and tight. So you want small theta zero. How do you get a small theta zero? So you want basically this number to be small, right? Because that's the argument in the arc sign. So how do you make that small? Either you need a large A, so you need a large aperture, right? Or you increase your F. That's 
so go to higher frequencies. And the point I made earlier, which is higher frequency means better angular resolution, that's directly coming from here because as you make your frequency higher and higher, your radiation pattern or your beam pattern becomes you know, more directional. You can get maybe something like that, uh, which is at higher frequencies or bigger, bigger apertures, right? Um, so uh, this, this trade-off actually that to get higher resolution, you need either bigger emitters, bigger apertures, or higher frequencies. Um, here we derived it for acoustic waves. You would see the exact same thing happens at RF frequencies and optical frequencies. This is kind of like one of those universal laws of physics that if you want higher resolution, more focused beams, no matter how you're generating your waves, is it acoustic wave or RF wave or, 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 or optical frequencies, either you need to go to higher frequencies or you need larger sources. Um, and, and that's always the case. Even in photography, if you're into photography, you know, like to get, to get higher resolution, you need bigger lenses, you know, with uh, bigger apertures, because then you can get a tighter focused light into your sensor, which is a sharper image, higher resolution, right? So, so this is, I hope by now, kind of, at least for the acoustic waves, you know where this is coming from. Uh, it's, it's actually coming from the solutions to the wave equation with, with uh, the approximations that, that we did. Okay, does this make sense so far? I hope it does. Okay. So, going back to where we started, we said the principle of operation is the emitter transmits a wave, it hits a target, and echo comes back and then you need to process the echo to find the range and, and the bearing angle. We talked about the forward path so far, right? So we know exactly when the emitter generates a wave for a given emitter geometry, what does that radiation pattern or beam pattern look like? Specifically, if I were to you know, draw it here, it actually looks like something like this. As a function of angle, right? Um, and then there is a one over range also decay uh, uh, as, as, it, as, it, as it propagates. Um, one thing to note, by the way, in, in this uh, plot here, uh, this is actually, I'm, I'm showing a cross section here, but it's actually 3D, right? So this, this main lobe and the, all the side lobes, these actually look like teardrops, if you will, right? So they, your theta, you know, there is, there is rotational symmetry in this, and we're just looking at the slice of it. But the actual beam it goes, you know, it's, it's like this elongated uh, teardrop that propagates in the 3D space. Okay, so now we want to look at what the reflected echo is going to be, because that is what you receive and you need to process to be able to determine your uh, time of flight. And, and bearing angle. So we, we have looked at the forward path. Now we need to model what happens as it hits the target and propagates back to the receiver. It turns out that it's super simple, actually. It's all a few steps that you need to do. First, we make an approximation that the targets for now are small compared to the wavelength, right? So if you are dealing with small targets, almost like point reflectors, um, what happens is that the echo from the target, you can model that uh, uh, as a spherical wave. Because it's a tiny target, you hit it with a wave, and what it echoes back, it's a spherical wave. And as we know, for spherical waves, the amplitude is proportional, uh, inversely proportional to the travel distance, right? So from this, you, we can say that from the target echo back to the receiver, there should be like a one over rho decay factor if we model our target as a small, you know, almost like a point source. Um, then it turns out that most of the emitters used in uh, uh, sonar sensing, they can also operate as receivers. I mean, that's also true about, you know, uh, 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 audio speakers, you know. If you give it a signal, that aperture vibrates and generates a, a wave for you. If you hit it with an acoustic wave and that vibrates the, the, the aperture, it will generate a signal for you. So every speaker can also be a microphone and, and, and the other way around, if you will. Uh, and and uh, uh, for that reason, uh, the, the emitters are, are, are usually called transducers because they, they operate both ways. They can transmit for you and they also can receive echoes back for you. 
And if you have one of these, which operates as a transmitter and a receiver, if you have a transducer, then um, by, by the reciprocity of the, the, the physics of the environment, it means that the sensitivity pattern of your receiver to the echo uh, is also governed by the exact same beam pattern that we found, especially in terms of the angle, right? So if S of theta is the sensitivity of your receiver to an echo that's coming from an angle theta, just because it's the same as the, as the transmitter, that function is also exactly given by this uh, Bessel function. Uh, and, and that's just by, by basically the reciprocity of the, of the physics. There's a gamma here, which is some normalization constant. Doesn't matter for our analysis. But how sensitive the receiver is to echoes coming at, from different DOAs, it is given by the exact same radiation pattern of the, of, the, of the transmitter, because the transmitter and the receiver are the same. Uh, finally, there is this gain factor of the, of the transducer, which is basically how much of the echo energy you capture, right? Uh, so the echo is coming from some angle. Your angle sensitivity is given by this function. But also, the bigger the, the receiver aperture, more of the echo energy you would capture, OK? So we have this gain factor which is proportional. So uh, it's z of some, some constant times a squared. So it's proportional to the area of your transducer. That's your gain factor, right? So to find the echo, all we need to do is stack these basically three effects that we just talked about. So what happens is that if p sub e of rho and theta is the echo amplitude that you have received from a target at some range rho and some bearing angle theta, what happens is that you first hit it with your transmitted uh, acoustic wave. That we already solved for, right? That's p of rho and theta. Some fraction of that acoustic wave is reflected back to you. The fraction, let's say it's delta. It's a number between 0 and 1, right? That's kind of like the brightness, if you will, of the target in, in acoustic wave, right? That's how, how much it reflects back. Then there is a 1 over rho term. That's coming from assumption number 1, which is a small target. It's echoing back a spherical wave, so there's going to be a 1 over rho decay as it comes in the return path, as it comes from the target to the receiver. Then at the receiver, you multiply by your sensitivity as a function of theta, which is given by this function, and your gain which is basically some constant times the area of your receiver. Plug everything in, right? All of these we, we now know. If you plug everything in, your final echo that you receive at your receiver is given by this, this big ugly expression here. What's important is you know the dependencies. It depends on 1 over distance squared. And by the way, we have not factored in acoustic attenuation like Stokes's law. We have ignored it for now. We are assuming if, even in a lossless medium, you still get a 1 over rho squared. And that's just by conservation of energy. Uh, you get a 1 over rho squared uh, drop in the echo amplitude that you get. It's linear in frequency. It's proportional to the fourth power of the, the, the radius of your aperture. And then the angle dependency is basically this square. Sorry, I crossed it off. But there's a square here, remember, because in the forward path, you get it once. And then in the re return path, you get it in the S, so you get the square of that uh, Bessel, Bessel function, basically. So now we know we, ha we have solved the full physics. We know for a given aperture that is a circular disk, what is, and a target that is at some range rho and some angle theta, what is the echo that the receiver receives uh, from the target? I think this is a good uh, place to stop. And then next time, we talk about how do you process this received echo to actually do ranging, bearing estimation, and finally mapping. Any questions? Yes. If it transmits and it receives, like, if it's, does it keep transmitting, or it just stops? And then That's a great question. So uh, the question is, if the transmitter and the receiver are the same, it's one transducer, so does it transmit and then stop and listen, or does it continuously transmit? It has to stop and listen, right? Otherwise, it interferes with it itself. So when you have a transducer that is like a transmitter and a receiver, it, trans it sends a pulse, and then it listens for the echo. It waits for all the echoes for to die off, and then it sends the next one. We'll talk about it next time, but that's a great question.